Today we're going to be reading a few verses from 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 15 rather. And let's be honest, like the last few weeks have been pretty dense, haven't they? <laughs> dense as in heavy rather than like they were thick and stupid. <laughs> like, they've been pretty, I mean last week was a technical passage. We looked at something that's quite controversially kind of understood. And the week before that we were talking about fathers and trying to encourage men, which, let's be honest, is one of the most controversial things you can do in a society like this. The week before that, we're talking about prophecy and tongues. And so this week, I wanted a lighter one. Um, so we're going to look at a few verses together, and we're going to just invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us through you and, and to pray together and respond to what God wants to say. Here we go, though. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Remember, the Apostle Paul's writing a letter to a church in Corinth, and we're at chapter 15. He says, Now... Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, Then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and in his grace towards me, his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how could some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is not true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. This is God's word. We are in all of all people most to be pitied. Most to be pitied. How is your relationship with um, what gets called evangelism, sharing the gospel? How do you feel when you hear the word evangelism? Um, is it a, is it like a swear word? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? You know, I'm standing up here wearing a Chingfest t-shirt as a walking billboard that next Sunday, 11 a.m., we're down at the field. We're going to be gathering as a church to proclaim the good news in public and then run a festival. How do you feel about that? I think it's okay to acknowledge that for, for many of us, it's a big deal just to come next week, isn't it? Just to sit in the park with us and associate yourself with the church in public. That's a big deal, and I want to acknowledge that. Most to be pitied. <laughs> How, are you happy to sit there and think, people may be pitying me most of all. <laughs> people may be being annoyed at me for making noise and for pushing my religion on them in public. How do you feel about public evangelism or just associating yourself with the church? Now, it might be, you might sit there and think, it's easy for extroverts like you because you are you clearly are a middle child and you need people to, you know, you need attention all the time. It's all right for people like you because you like standing on stages and talking to people about Jesus. You, oh, it's fine. But for me, don't you understand? I'm an introvert. I'm shy. And I hate the idea of this. Well, it would be easy for you to think that of me. But you have to understand, I grew up in a home that really was passively anti-religion. Did not, I didn't go to church. In fact, I grew up, like, like all of us, watching and picking up things from the media about how awkward and embarrassing Christians are. And my experience of Christians growing up was that they were quite awkward and embarrassing. (laughs) And the very thought of being associated with Christians and Christianity used to fill me with dread. 
Wasn't I committing intellectual suicide in becoming a Christian? Wasn't I alienating myself from the cool, the cool kids or the, the stream of history to become a Christian? I remember when I was at uni, having just become a Christian, and I, I went shopping in town one day, and I stumbled across the church that I was part of doing a public outreach. And there's people there. All they were doing was handing out leaflets to people on the street advertising something like Alpha. And I knew them because I'd started going to church. I'd recently become a Christian. They came up to me and said, oh, Jeff, great to see you. We're just handing out these leaflets. Can you hand out some leaflets with us? I mean, what could be so hard? Just standing in the street handing out leaflets to passers-by. At that moment, like, I just died inside. I felt so scared and so ashamed of the thought of being associated with the church in public. So I, I said to them, no, I can't. And they're like, well, are you busy? I'm like, no, I just don't want to. I really don't want to. I'm just scared. And I walked away. <laughs> and actually, I went, I, I went home and I, I, I wrote about it in a journal because I'm, I was a dear diarier at the time. <laughs> I wrote about it and I said to the Lord, I am a coward. I am a coward, Lord. The thought of doing something like this, even just handing out a leaflet, terrifies me. I don't want to be a Christian in public. I'd rather, I'm happy going to church, but in, a, in public, Anyway, so I went home and the Bible says that we boast in our weaknesses because in our weakness the Lord makes us strong, doesn't it? That's what the Apostle Paul said. And so I boasted, like I'm a coward, I can't do this. And over the time I was at uni, the Lord did lots in my life, such that at the end of my three years at uni, we had a public outreach in the park. And they said to me, will you preach the gospel? And I said, yeah, okay. Three years after saying, I can't even hand out a leaflet, I found myself standing on a stage sharing the good news about Jesus with people. What had happened? What changed? I went from saying, I'm I'm most to be pitied, I don't want to be associated, to sharing it. Now, and it's not a finished work, because if you're anything like me, you know that we have moments of courage, boldness, and then we retreat back into fear at times. So when I was a youth worker at the church in Eastbourne, I gathered some guys together that I was discipling and I said, let's go out onto the streets and let's approach members of the public and talk to them about Jesus. And I said, let's make it easy. I'll give you a clipboard with questions on it and we'll pretend we're doing a survey. We'll be one of those people. Um, Let's go out onto the streets and ask people questions about religion and faith. And the guys that I was discipling, bless them, they were like, yeah, let's do this. And I thought to myself, oh no, they said yes. So we went out onto the streets in Eastbourne, and the guys that I was discipling were amazing. They one at a time just went up to people and said, hello, I'm doing a question about religious belief in the area. Can I ask you some questions about God and what you think? And so they asked these questions. I went with them, and I sat on a bench and watched them (laughs) because I was too scared to go and talk to members of the public. So I say that to say, like, I'm, I'm still a coward by nature, particularly when it comes to talking to people about Jesus. I am. And I don't think it has much to do with extroversion or introversion or confidence or not, because this is a spiritual battle, and we need help in this. So I'm aware that for many of us, coming next Sunday will be hard. But nevertheless, I want you to do it anyway. The Lord has called us, I believe, and it's not just a nice phrase we use. He's called us to be the most prayerful generous and courageous community we can be now that doesn't mean that we are already the most prayerful generous and courageous it doesn't it means this is the direction of travel that he's inviting us to be such that in the future we'll be able to say look at how courageous we are as a community but right now this is the first kind of let's get out of the boat of this building and let's go into public let's step out in faith and encourage most of all men to be pitied, the Apostle Paul said. Which, let's be honest, that's, that's not how a lot of people think about Christianity. A lot of religious leaders think differently as well. They think religion, I've heard this before from, from bishops, religion, even if Jesus is not raised from the dead, the practices of community and worship and contemplation and prayer, those are edifying and person, they give me personal satisfaction and health. Those are good things in themselves so that even if Jesus isn't alive, I've lived a nice life of contemplation. People have said that and they say that. Oh, it's, there are a lot of benefits to being part of church, even if it's not true. You know, it doesn't matter because you get a lot of benefits from it, don't you? The community, the sense of purpose, etc., all those things. The Apostle Paul says, I am of most people to be pitied. If, the, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, 
we are to be pitied above all people. Why would Paul say that? And yet so many people say, oh, you know, there's, there's, there's benefits to Christianity, even if it's not true. What's wrong with Paul <laughs> that he would feel so pitied by this? I think a couple of things would be wrong with Paul. The first is he says we, we are found to be misrepresenting God. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, we're misrepresenting God. But the second thing he says, and you see this time and time and again in his letters, the Apostle Paul deliberately made life choices that involved sacrifice and suffering and persecution for the sake of the gospel. He suffered imprisonment, shipwreckings, beatings for the sake of the gospel, such that he could say, I have deliberately spent my body and bones and my reputation on this, so that if this is not true, I have wasted my life being abused by the world when I could have just gone along with it. Paul stakes everything on this idea that Christ is raised. He's so certain of it that he's willing time and time again to get maligned and mistreated for the sake of the gospel. In fact, you read about it in the book of Acts. When he visits a place, he tells them the good news of Jesus. They beat him up, throw stones at him, and they drag him out of the city. And there's this hilarious line, hilarious line, where he basically he gets up, and he goes back into the city and tries again. Because he thinks, I must not have done it right. Because this is the best news in the world. Why would someone respond like this? That's, that's his response. Most of all men, most to be pitied. Where does the Apostle Paul's courage to live that kind of life come from? Where does, where does courage come from? Um, where does, how do we turn a nice belief in an idea to conviction that it's true enough that, like a lot of Christians, I'm going to offer my head to the sword, my neck to the sword, or my reputation to the public, where does that level of conviction come from? Well, I think in this section that we read, you see three, three ways the Apostle Paul appeals to the church that can help us in this respect. First of all, he says, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters. So the first thing he does is he reminds them. And the reason he reminds them of the gospel is because for the last few chapters, he's been really having a go at them, hasn't he? He's been saying, when you come together, your meetings do more harm than good. I mean, that's, that's not the best Ofsted report you can get, for a church can get, is it? Your meetings do more harm than good. You should stop meeting together. And then he says, when you gather, like one of you has this song, one of you has that tongue, prophecy, and you're just behaving chaotically. And he's basically saying, stop it, do it like this, sort yourselves out. Last week, we looked at how he tells people to stop talking like this, stop talking like that. He's telling them off. And so he says, now let me remind you of the gospel. Let me remind you of your identity. We're going to screw up. We'll get things wrong. But the fact of the matter is that he says, I preached the gospel to you. You received it. You're standing in it and you're being saved. So the first thing he does is reminds them of their identity, that you are those who are being saved. God's got a hold of you. So you'll make plenty of mistakes. But your behavior doesn't define your identity anymore. Jesus does. The second thing he does after that is he then, he then explains to them the good news again. He reminds them, you're Christians. You know, you're in Christ. You're being saved. And then he says, let me just explain this to you again in case you need a little bit more than just reminding. Maybe your faith is waning. Uh, maybe you, you've lived too long in this society and it's constant drip feeding of doubt and cynicism and it's kind of gotten into you and you're starting to think, oh, I don't know if this is true. I mean, it feels nice, but are these all deluded people? I mean, they're nice, but are they nice deluded people? And so he explains to them, Christ Jesus, and this is one of the, the commentators reckon this is one of the earliest formulations of a Christian creed, like a, a, an agreed on central definition of the faith. He says, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. That's the, that's the gospel that he's, he's saying to them again. And then he goes further and explains. In case, I don't know, you might be feeling a little bit doubtful. He says, then he appeared to more than 500. So it wasn't just Cephas and the twelve. Because let's be honest, the twelve were so wanting Jesus to be the Messiah, they could have made it up. They could have, it could have been wish fulfillment. And so he says, well, he didn't just appear to the 12. He then appeared to 500 people at one time. You don't get mass hallucinations of 500 people. And then he says, um, oh, 500 people at one time, most of, who are, most of whom are still alive. In other words, you can go and ask them. 
If you're still full of doubt, you can go and ask these people who saw him. And you can check it out for yourself. Christianity is not based on philosophy and ideas that man that have been man-made and just plucked out of the sky. It's not subjective to the point that a, a guru said, I believe that the divine has said this to me. No, it's, it's objectively verifiable. I could have, if I was around at the time, I could have seen Jesus or I could have asked people who've seen Jesus. And not just one or two people, 500 people, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, he says. And that word asleep is significant. He's talking about them dying but not being gone, just sleeping because of the resurrection, as he's going to go on to say. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and then last of all to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. In other words, you can check this out for yourself. I've seen him. These other people have seen him. There's a need to explain it to them. And then what happens in the last section that I read about the resurrection, he says, you know, if Christ is proclaimed as raised, how can it be that some of you are saying he's not, there is no such thing as a resurrection? He then goes through, and for the rest of the chapter we'll be looking at in a couple of weeks' time, he walks through different kind of objections to the concept of resurrection. Is it really true that someone's been raised from the dead? How can we really believe that? What's, what did he look like? What does this mean for the future? Are you really sure? And I think, again, this is significant because for some of us, we just need to be reminded, you're in Christ. This is your identity. Your behavior does not define you. For some of us, we need to be ex- have the gospel explained to us again because we've leaked it and we've forgotten and we've started to think it's all wish fulfillment. And we need to be explained, no, no, you can go and ask them. They saw him. This is testable, you know, verifiable, evidential things. But for many of us, we've got a lot of, we're, we're wrestling with difficult questions, objections to the faith. And so what the Apostle Paul does is he engages on a rational level, doesn't he? He takes the question and he reasons with them and he explains his his mode of thinking and walks that takes them on a journey. And that's for many of us what we need as well. Your objections, your doubts are not a sign that Christ has not been raised. Your objections and your doubts are actually breadcrumbs towards more faith if only you're willing with courage to engage rationally in some of the questions that you're asking. Gone is the day, if there ever was a day, but gone is the day where we can get by with what's called easy believism. I believe it because my parents tell me it's true. I believe it because I'm in a Christian country. I believe it because it feels nice. Gone are the day where we can just have fridge magnets on our fridges and say, I believe it because of the fridge magnet and this Bible verse makes me feel happy. Actually, we need, we're living in a society that more and more is asking the church to be mature enough to ask hard questions and to submit what they believe to hard questions. And I think in the way the Apostle Paul speaks to the church, he's saying, don't be afraid of the the hard objections that people have because Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, we're of all men most to be pitied. And actually, whenever I have conversations with people about the faith who aren't Christians, I I say to them with all genuineness, if I'm wrong, I need your help to convince me because I don't want to waste my life care enough about me, non-Christian friend, to speak truth to me. And I say that to them because I'm being truthful, but also I know over 20 years of being a Christian and walking with the Lord, there's been no objection that I've come up with that has done anything to pull planks out of my faith. As I said, they've often really just been breadcrumbs to more faith. But I think that's what the Apostle Paul does. He appeals to them. He reminds them, he explains to them, and he reasons with them. And all of those things, I think, can help fan our faith to give us courage. Because the Holy Spirit, when he comes to give you courage, he doesn't just come and zap you in, the, in isolation, in a room, in a vacuum somewhere, which is how many of us think about God and courage and boldness. And we think, oh, I'm a coward, God. I can't do this. I'm too scared. Please zap me with some feeling of courage. Behaving like that is is rather like me as a 16-year-old. This is what I used to do. We'd go to school discos, and I would lack nerves. I would, sorry, lack courage. I'd be full of nerves. Didn't know how to talk to anybody, particularly girls. And so I would consume as many Skittles as I could, the sweet Skittles. Because Skittles are just full of healthy E-numbers to give a te- like an insecure teenage boy confidence to talk to girls. And that's what I used to do. Like, just going to consume this and it will zap me with like, hyperactivity. And I'll be like, hi, <laughs> what a dance. <laughs> no one ever did. So maybe, maybe the Skittles weren't the help I needed. 
Many of us, I think, approach God like that. I'm lacking courage, God. Zap me. And then I'll have plenty of courage. What the Apostle Paul does, I think, is he says, let me remind you of the gospel. This is who you are. Let me explain it to you. This is true. And let me engage with some of the difficult questions people are starting to ask. Because as your mind hears the word of God, the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and produces faith. That faith does not happen in isolation to the word of God. The Apostle Paul says elsewhere that faith comes by hearing, hearing through the word of God. And as we hear the word of God spoken, the Holy Spirit then confirms it, fills us with courage. And one of the first things that happens along that journey is that your identity changes, doesn't it? You move from being a servant, a cringing slave of God, to being a son or daughter, dearly loved by God. You know, have you ever seen some kids when they're out and about doing reckless things, you know, uh, teenagers who have no care for their personal safety. One reason they can do that is because they're teenagers and they have no care for their personal safety. But another reason that they can do that, and kids have a lot of confidence in the public, when they know they're loved. And when they know they're loved at home, they can be bold in public. And when you know that the Father loves you in home, in the church, you can be as bold as lions in public because you know you're loved. So that's why the Apostle Paul starts with your identity. And whenever he writes to the churches, that's what he does. And he describes three ways in these verses of how he shared the gospel with them. He says, first thing, I, I, I brought to you, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached. That word preached there is just, I, I heralded good news. I brought good news to you. Like the good news of someone on the phone saying, it's a boy. I brought good news to you. That verb is used elsewhere in the New Testament when the angel appears to Mary and says, I bring you good news. Glad tidings of great joy. I bring you good news. I'm preaching good news to you. That's what he does. He's delivering to them. But the second thing he says, other than preaching the good news to them, and by the way, preaching the good news doesn't just look like this. It also looks like sitting down with someone over coffee and sharing the good news with them. And that's actually how the early church grew. It was through people chatting door to door, house to house, marketplace to marketplace. Have you heard that Jesus is alive? Therefore, our sins can be forgiven. Therefore, we can know God. And we can have peace with God. Therefore, we have hope after death. Therefore, all of the suffering that we experience in the world is not futile and meaningless. Because the Lord will use it to do something beautiful with it. But that's the first thing he says. The second thing he says... I delivered to you as of first importance, he says. First thing, I preached the good news to you. Second, I, when, what that means is I delivered to you as of first importance this, that Christ Jesus was died for our sins, died for our sins. I delivered to you as of first importance. And we're living in a society where there's lots and lots of things we could talk about that express our Christian view. You could talk to, and I've, done, I've made this mistake before. When I want to talk to someone about Jesus, I'll start with an ethical issue. And I'll say, what do you think about this latest ruling on this? Or what do you think about what the newspapers are saying about that? And I'll try to share a Christian point of view. And often that ends in doors being shut, labels being thrown, <laughs> go away, leave me alone. The Apostle Paul doesn't start by saying, I delivered to you what the church thinks about gender equality. Or I delivered to you what the church thinks about whatever the latest issue is. He says, I delivered you as of first importance. The thing that really matters is this, that Christ Jesus died for your sins. That old-fashioned word that essentially means you missed the target. He, del he was delivered over to you, uh, over, he was delivered for us because of our constant misalignment. We're always missing the target of what God wants for us in our lives. And we're broken, and we can't help it. But that's what he delivered. But in using that word delivered, I think it's interesting because... He says that your role in evangelism, in sharing the good news, is to deliver someone the good news. Like delivering a bill <laughs> that someone needs to pay. And it's up to the individual what they do with that. Your role in sharing the good news isn't to cause someone to become a Christian. It's to just deliver to them clearly that's the good news. And it's up to them what they do about it. And then final thing that happens is he says, we proclaimed to you that Christ has been raised from the dead. 
So what I've looked at so far is three ways that he appeals to them. He reminds them, he explains to them, and he reasons with them. And then three ways that he describes what sharing the gospel looks like. He's sharing the good news. He's delivering something to them. And he's proclaiming to them that Christ has been raised from the dead. And this is the proclamation that next week we'll be doing from the part, on the park. And actually, I'm thrilled to say, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but um, Kirsty Langsford is going to be delivering a gospel message for 10 minutes just about the goodness of Jesus. So we're going to be praying for her and ask you to pray for her during the week. But that's what he says. He declares the, the kind of the victory of Jesus over the grave. And I wanted to share something with you that was written in 300 AD that always fires my boilers. This is a man named Athanasius who was a defender of Christianity. Athanasius had a slogan, and his uh, slogan was Athanasius Contra Mundi, which is Latin, so you know it must be impressive. His, his slogan was Athanasius Contra Mundi, which means Athanasius against the world. Because because someone said to him, Athanasius, what are you doing? Don't you know that everybody, the whole world, disagrees with you? And he said to them, like Pumbaa in The Lion King, if the world is against Athanasius, then Athanasius is against the world. <laughs> and that was his slogan. I loved it. But he, he wrote a kind of a tract about Jesus' glory and triumph over the dead. And he said this, consider this, that Jesus died. In dying, we know this, dead men cannot take effective action. Seems obvious enough. Their power to influence others lasts only until the grave. Fair enough. Well, well then, he says, look at the facts of this case. The Savior Jesus is working mightily among men. Every day, he is invisibly persuading numbers of people all over the world, both within and beyond the Greek-speaking world, to accept his faith and to be obedient to his teaching. Can anyone, in face of this, still doubt that he is risen and lives, or rather that he is himself alive? And then he says, we are agreed. I'll keep going. We are agreed, aren't we? We are agreed that a dead person can do nothing. Yet the Savior works mightily every day, drawing men to himself, persuading them of his teaching, teaching them about immortality and quickening their thirst for heavenly things, revealing the knowledge of the Father and inspiring strength in face of death. He proclaims to them, Christ is alive and we know he's alive because we know that dead men have no power and yet this one has done it to so many of you and so many billions of people across the planet, he's done it. This one has drawn you, has, he's persuaded you, he's impressed himself upon you. He's alive. You know, he goes on to say elsewhere, and I'll end with this, that throughout human history, men and women have worshipped idols. We've made things out of stone or wood, and we've put them on a table, and we've said, this is my God. And we bow down and we give power to that thing that we've made. And that's happen that happens in every society. It's happening now. You know, we don't call it an idol anymore. We just call it a TV. And we, we put things in our houses and we just devote ourselves to them and their teaching. And Athanasius says, people have always done this. But they're, they're stopping to do it now. Why? What has happened in human history that is causing men and women to throw their idols in the bin? He says, Christ is risen, he's alive, and he's conquered all other gods. Everything else that people devote themselves to, he's destroying them. He's displayed his power over them. The gods of our age, the gods of their age, the same things. Money, wealth, sex, power, authority, influence, the things that people long for. Jesus is saying those to be rubbish. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes elsewhere, whatever I had to my gain, I consider it loss compared to knowing Jesus. And that's what happens when you meet him. It's that word in you, confirmed by the Holy Spirit, that causes us to be very bold before men and women. And so I want to invite you, I want to dare you, I want to encourage you to join us next Sunday at 11 a.m., as we in our small way, in this small patch of England, stand up and say, Jesus is alive. And that has relevance to your life.